Today on the show, we have Leah Canfield from Mountain Homes Group with Coldwell Banker Mountain Properties in Breckenridge and all of Summit County uh, in Colorado. Let me tell you more about Leah. Leah Canfield is a real estate agent in her hometown of Breckenridge, Colorado. She grew up ski racing and was at the peak of her career the fastest junior super G skier in the country. Now she is now one of the top selling cold wool banker agents, not only in the country, but actually in, in the entire world. She ranks in the top 0.4% of all Coldwell Banker agents worldwide. She has been named to both Coldwell Bankers and Realtor Magazine's 30 Under 30. She loves to ski, mountain bike, and travel. I want you to visit Leah at her group's a homepage, which is mountainhomesgroup.com. Again, mountainhomesgroup.com. That link will be in our show notes. Leah, welcome to the show. Thank you. What, what an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I am. Uh, I, I will tell you the intro doesn't even begin to really explain how excited I am because you know we've done. I think I don't know what number episode this will be. Some four hundred, uh, low four hundreds, and wow. you know I, I oftentimes this is a little embarrassing. I sometimes don't get to do the prep for the show until pretty close to to the show. I have people that that help uh, put together notes for me, and I was really excited this morning when I got to the office um, and started reading about you because. Um, not only, of course, you know, you have this sort of impressive background with, with, you know, competitive skiing and, and being an athlete, um, but also having a tremendous success pretty early on in the business career of, of being a real estate agent. And you also gave us a, some talking points that we're going to get into about grind culture and your thoughts on that. So I am really, really excited to chat with you. So thank you for, for coming on the show. I don't always get to say that or don't always even feel that sometimes with, with all of the guests that we have, as much as I love our guests, um, this one really speaks to me, this topic of, of grind culture. So I would love to start cool. all, all the way at the beginning of, of sort of where you entered. Uh, I'd love to start really at the beginning of competitive skiing and, and move our way sure. into real estate, because I think there's probably some parallels and, and some disciplines that, that translated over. Um, but tell us about this. How did, had you been skiing your entire life starting out very young or did you get into yeah. it when you were, okay. No, yeah. I started very young. I uh, learned to ski when I was two. My dad actually a whole different story, but he's an amputee above the knee. Um, he was a big skier and he was a Paralymp a Paralympian. So he really got me wow. into the sport. Um, and I ski raced through my whole childhood, uh, through being a young adult, I got to travel internationally to ski race, which was very cool. Um, I don't think I even realized how cool it was until now. And, um, I, I started to get some really good success. Um, but I, I was one of those people that was always going like 120%. So that led to actually quite a bit of injury in my career. I had five knee surgeries before I turned 20. And those wow. have really, yeah, they have quite a long recovery time period. So sure. for like five or six years, I was just under the knife and in physical therapy and just always trying to get back into sport and then re-injuring myself. Um, so that, was, you know, that was the, were the injuries, um, were the injuries due to like, um, falling or were they like wearing out the cartilage or like, um, what were? yeah, it was a little bit of both. It was some like coming back to sport too soon or too aggressively. Some uh, certainly crashing. Um, some actually were due, I think, to some procedures that in the medical field, they thought were going to be very successful and actually had a pretty high failure rate. So some failed kind of, um, installations of, you know, ligaments and so forth, but, but yeah, it was, it was a lot. So ultimately that was going to be my career path. <laughs> I had decided for myself. Were, were um, you, were you thinking like, were you looking Olympics? Was that sort yeah. of, that oh, was the yeah. goal? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was going to be, this was my life. Um, but I, I decided, hey, look, this is, my body's not designed for this and this is too much and I, I quit. Um, yeah. yeah, which was tough. But then after that, I wasn't sure what to do. I worked at a coffee shop down, uh, which is still here in Breckenridge Plants for a few years. And I was like, okay, I got to, I got to do something. I could, felt like I had to do something. So I went to um, a local community college just for like the summer and went to a few classes, Sure, had an economics teacher who said, Hey, like buy these books, buy these business books. So I bought them. And my now husband at the time was like, what a waste of money. Like those are going to put you to sleep. You're never going to read those. <laughs> and I like to tell that story now because they literally changed our lives. We just started our journey into learning about 
um, like financial freedom and personal finance and how real estate can have such a huge role in this um, developing net worth and um, like freedom of your own life, really. Yeah. Um, to have, yeah, all those great topics. So do, that's do you mind sharing a, a one, one or more of those yeah. book titles? Just because yeah, yeah. they, if they changed your life, <laughs> I want to hear about they them. They did, they did. And there's so many good ones, but like some of the real basics, learning like what an asset is, and what a liability is. You know, yeah. Rich, Dad, Poor, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read that, sure. I was like, light bulb you know some people love that book some people hate it but i felt like it was life-changing for me can i ask you a question about that book because i I always want to ask somebody do is a primary residence an asset i know this is a debatable topic you know what is your thought okay i i think it depends i can't just say Yes. yes or no because the definition of an asset in my mind and probably from you know reading verbatim from the book is something that makes you money Right, right. Something which, which this does not, and only yeah. on the day you sell it, it possibly exactly. it could make you money. Yeah, exactly. And and we've taken this approach with our primary residence, at least that we decided to build this and build it as an investment. But um, you know, the fact that we didn't sell it after a couple of years and we're still living here, it's questionable. You know, so it's a lifestyle. Maybe someday. Yeah. It's a lifestyle investment. But I will say that we were right. very um, uh, intentional about the equity we had in our house, the location, making sure that we were um, treating it not just as a primary residence, but also as an investment. So we had our investment hat on when we pursued our home. And um, I think we always kind of will, but it depends. In that the way. only reason I'm bringing that up is I feel that yeah. oftentimes I'll ask realtors, not so much on the mm-hmm. show, but just in my, you know, my day-to-day understanding. Yeah. And, and sometimes they've never been asked that question. And I, I've always yeah. thought it's, it's a really important thing to have a position on, whether it's, yes, it's an asset, no, it's not, or it depends, yeah. have an answer because there are a lot of people who will be having questions like that. And anyway, so I'm sorry, I don't yeah. want, I didn't want to get us caught no, yeah. up in, in what's yeah. an asset, but, but I, I, just because say- you mentioned that, I wanted to hear your perspective. Yeah. I would say that it's a really important savings account, especially for people who maybe aren't very actively investing. Um, having equity built in your home is some of the, it, it's the only way for some people that they can actually successfully retire. So if you're not an active investor and you're not have, buying, um, you know, and cash flowing investment properties and building up your 401k or your retirement plan, sometimes a home is your only real yeah. worth in, when it comes to net worth. So I think it's extremely important for a lot of people. So anyway, you, you read, you read books like Rich Dad, yeah, Poor Dad read books, and, change my life. <laughs> and, and then, how did you decide to get into, to get into real estate as not just maybe an investor yeah, or yeah. as somebody who's going to be selling it? Yeah. So we started on the investment side. I actually then went to CU Boulder, got my degree in um, finance and real estate during which time we picked, started a very small investment company, like a few people and bought a little house and fixed it up and rented it out and then sold it and then did that a handful of times. And after the first time we bought that house, I was like, we bought this and I have absolutely no idea what just happened. Right. You know, I went to school to study this and I'm like, what, you know? (laughs) So then I realized I need to get my real estate license to learn what I'm doing in order to be a real investor who takes herself seriously. So I started and just got my license to support the investment side. And then it really grew from there. Um, And I, I realized just how, Number one, it was much more challenging than I thought it was going to be. And number two, it was more lucrative than I thought it could ever be and more fun. So yeah, it grew. And how long have you been practicing as, as a realtor? Um, it's been almost seven years. So 2015. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So you got it. You really got into it pretty quickly after. So, so your, your ski career sort of came to a a conclusion, Mm -hmm. then it was college and then right into sort of investing in real estate. Yeah. And being a, being a realtor. Um, so let's go back seven years only because so seven years doing the quick math on that. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, 2015 ish. I'm just trying to think of what the market conditions were at that time. What was it like starting a, a career in real estate? Now, yes, you, you I imagine you have s- some sort of public uh, notoriety being from Breckenridge, being being a competitive skier that that's probably been in the newspapers a lot and and sort of the you know whatever publications people there read. So I'm sure you're yeah. known to some degree in your yeah. community. Although there's probably a lot of competitive skiers there too. Yeah. Uh, there's some but, incredible but, athletes there. <laughs> but did you know? But making a pivot. Oh, I'm sure 
making a pivot from professional being a professional athlete to then selling real estate um it, it, as a person in their early 20s um yeah. what was that like I, I imagine that couldn't have been necessarily an easy thing no it really wasn't um people did know me for sure but they they weren't uh they knew me as like someone's kid they knew my parents they yeah. knew me because i have been here since i was like nine sure. right and so they weren't uh you know when it comes time for them to sell their multi-million dollar home they're not like yeah let's hire let's hire our friend's kid um so <laughs> that was certainly tough and not only that but our market is extremely saturated with agents there's like this running sure. joke that at, you know if you are at a dinner party like half the people there are real estate agents um yeah. and so it was highly competitive as well so my initial strategy actually wasn't to go after clientele of local people that I knew because they also already knew a dozen or more agents that have been in the business much longer than me. Um, so that wasn't my initial approach. I, I started really focusing on one of our, our number one feeder market, which is the Denver front range area and working on, um, getting those people as they come into town and stroll main street and also, uh, making really good connections with the agents that work in Denver that have clients who say, Hey, we're thinking about buying something in the mountains. So that was my approach. And I think that that really helped me get, a foothold in the industry instead of, you know, it's another one of those books that I read that's great is the Blue Ocean Strategy. That's about Blue I don't, Ocean. I Reddit. don't know this. Wait, say that one more time. Blue Ocean. Um, yeah, it's called the Blue Ocean, and it's just um, in a nutshell, it's like, you know, you have your Red Ocean, which is highly competitive. Um, you know, I think it's like the being a local sharks. Breckenridge agent is Red Ocean competing with the, you know, for the same clients that everyone is competing yeah. for. And the blue ocean strategy is like, Hey, what's a way that you can look at your business a little differently where you have a lot less competition. And that was the way that I did that was say, Hey, I'm not going to compete for this one client that has, you know, a dozen realtor friends. I'm going to go after this person who doesn't know anybody in Breck. <laughs> so yeah, I love yeah. that. So you made, you made friends with, with realtors in the Denver yeah. area yeah. because you, do, you don't support the Denver area personally or, no. and, and they don't support Breckenridge. So this exactly. is, um, this is, that makes, boy, that makes so much sense. Really a great <laughs> opportunity for any of our listeners who either you know, live in areas where people buy vacation homes or maybe who yeah. where they retire to, or in, in the flip side, you have people that are leaving to go elsewhere in, in Illinois, Florida is, is a place where a lot of, for tax purposes, people retire for yeah. obviously the weather and, you know, whatever other reasons um, they might go there. And so that would be, you know, anyone who's a Florida agent, you should be just calling every realtor, you know, in, in the country and saying, Hey, if they're thinking of moving here, um, so that's very interesting. So how, yeah. so, so you, you then you, you it was more about building relationships and you also said something also as, as the people from Denver were, were, were coming into town, how were you sort of intercepting them? <laughs> well, so it, I, I don't know if all the offices have like a floor agent, right? So I was working on floor a lot. Um, I was at, the, and we have an office right on main street and that was extremely difficult for me because I had to overcome this sense that there was like something wrong with salespeople, that they were like yeah. bad people. And I had that sure. somehow ingrained in me that like, if I was going to sell something to someone, I was like doing a bad thing. Right. So I was not right. a natural born salesperson. And so it was very awkward. The first few times I interacted with people, I like blacked out before someone walked in, they walked out. I was like, what does that happen? Um, but it, you know, everything takes practice. And eventually I got up the confidence to just be personable and be myself and chat yeah. with these guys. And it also took me acknowledging that, Hey, I'm not just like, I'm not trying to take advantage of someone. I'm trying to, you know, help them because I am yeah. an, a resource for them. So once I kind of shifted my mindset that a salesperson is not, um, like, a, um, a parasite, but instead right. a, you know, a source of wealth of information and, you know, a friend and someone who can help you with something that you need. Once I made that shift, it was a lot easier for me. Yeah, I, I I so agree with that. And for anyone out there who's struggling with what Leah was talking about, this idea of I'm bothering people, they don't want to yeah. talk to me, they think I'm gross because I'm a salesperson and nobody likes salespeople and all of right. that. Yes, there's truth in all of that, of course. But 
if you're not a, a, a gross, um, slimy salesperson, you don't have to worry about coming off as slimy and gross. It's, yeah. it's what I say to guys all the time who go, I wonder if that girl thinks I'm a creep. I'm like, are you a creep? If you're not, you don't, you can go yeah. ask her out. It's okay. Yeah. Because if you're not a creep, you don't have to worry about being perceived as creepy. And the same yeah. thing with salespeople. If you're yeah. not a, a, a horrible human being, then you can go ahead and talk to people who, by the way, 99% chance they're going to use a realtor anyway. So yeah. this isn't even something like, hey, you really need to get into this bizarre insurance that you don't even know about, but I'm going to try to convince you you need, which no. by the way, is a perfectly fine uh, industry as well. I love <laughs> insurance agents, but that's a much tougher sale sometimes yes. because it's selling things that people don't even know they need. But in your case, they're going to use a realtor. So I, I just yeah. wanted to really um, honor you for saying that because I think it's so easy to forget um, that everybody, when they, and everybody starts out in this business, it, it's 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 a little nerve wracking to have your first yeah. open house to sit and and I love the fact that you live in an area where people still walk into uh, into offices that is not as common uh, you know, know. Everywhere else in the yeah. country but um, it's a little bit of a trial by fire <laughs> because they're coming in and or you know they're walking by and and you're not having to strike up a conversation yeah um, or at the end of it I would be walking out onto Main Street like hey what are you looking at in this window you know let's talk about it yeah. um so love yeah it. it took a little confidence boost. <laughs> I love that. So, so you, you really jumped in and again, yeah. you're still a young person, but I guess, I guess it too makes sense because you talked about everybody in town knows me as, you know, I'm a skier. I'm, I'm my father's daughter. Um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm, I'm a kid in my early twenties. I'm an adult technically, but people in town, maybe not only do they maybe see me a certain way, they also have, you know, a handful of other agents that maybe they're best friends with who, who yeah. are probably going to get the listings, uh, you know, above you just because yeah. that's how things work. Um, so let's talk about it. So, so you started working at, you know, in, in the office and, and, you know, dealing with floor time and, and mm -hmm. sort of trial by fire, I sort of would say is, is having direct one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and then how did you grow from there? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I started pretty early on coming up with a business plan and I think that those two words together caused people some, a lot of anxiety. But yeah. I, I don't remember who said this. It might have been Mark Cuban, but he's like, hey, if you can't come up with a business plan in the amount of time that it takes you to drink a can of soda, like you're doing it wrong. And that <laughs> stuck with me because it was like, okay, don't overcomplicate it. I get a small piece of paper or a um, post-it note or whatever. And I write down what I want to do in sales. You know, how does that translate? What's my average sales price? What do I think is attainable? How many sales is that? Um, how many appointments do I need to do? Do I need to make? And then I also did some really crude math of um, how approximately how many people do I think I need in my database? Sure. Um, I went to a ninja class. I think they said something like, you know, every person in your database translates to something like um, $10,000 of income or something, something along those lines that might be misquoting. But I, um, I said, look, I need to start building my database. Like nobody, I need to start putting my name, Leah Canfield, next to luxury real estate in as many instances as I can. So I started putting more and more people in my database and coming up with a plan that they saw my face and heard my name next to real estate. Um, I also started doing some like something I learned from Barbara Corcoran, which is yes. reach out to your local newspaper. Like these, these people are just usually young and hungry and overworked and have to come up with content for the newspaper. And they don't know, like they have to do it every single day. And so if you help them and say, Hey, look, this is super interesting. This is happening in our market. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna call you back and say, hey, can you explain this to me? And can I quote you on this? And then all of a sudden, your name is in the newspaper next to luxury real estate or whatever you decide. That's to really, in I'm gonna pause you. That is incredibly <laughs> interesting. Nobody yeah. has ever, ever made that suggestion on this podcast. So uh -huh. super exclusive for us. Um, so I wanna I want to just, just un uh, sort of unwind that a little bit so that our sure. audience really hits. I thought you were going to go a different way with it, which is <laughs> I do have this kind of cool story about my my background as a you know a, a junior skier who was you know headed to to Olympics and now I've pivoted because of injuries and like that's a very interesting story just in and of itself that a newspaper might be interested in, but that's a one off 
And so I yeah. thought you were going to say, well, I just wanted to sort of trade in a little bit on my notoriety and, and get some publicity, which that would have made all the sense in the world to me too. But you yeah. actually went a totally different way, which was <laughs> I want their their reporters to call me when they yeah. need a quote or or they need um, help with definitions or mm -hmm. that is beyond brilliant because you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, these are people that work on incredible deadlines they're underworked they are certain they're overworked and oh, underpaid yeah, yeah. yeah sorry uh, they are very overworked and underpaid and it's a stressful position and yeah. you can help actually make their lives a little easier and yeah. so people they the reporters started using you in stories i guess yeah yeah and i still try at least once a month to send them something interesting that's happening because i you know pull data for my newsletter every month i'm looking at you know what's happening this month in our market what are some you know sales that are very interesting or what you know we we've seen some really crazy stuff in our market right like sure you know, 200 percent appreciation of this and you know that's or, a great news story yeah. yeah yeah right and it's a headline so anything anytime i see something that i'm like this would be a good headline i send so it so how then, often how often do they end up using your your ideas i'm just probably 70 percent of the time you know every once in a while oh i want you to call gosh. back on something but most of the time they're like they call me back it might be two weeks or three weeks later and they're like hey just circling back to this can you tell me more about that and then it ends up yeah oh, that is that is so incredibly smart I, <laughs> I i'm a little bit Thanks. uh sort of gobsmacked with that i i really apps which is a great word that i'm just starting <laughs> to incorporate more into my uh it's one of those words that sort of makes you seem smarter than i'm um, saying i'm stunned um but but i i am i am gobsmacked and or stunned um because that that is an absolutely brilliant strategy so um thank yeah. you for that um so yeah, okay yeah, you started yeah so you started uh doing that that helped yeah. i imagine get your name out there it did yeah it helped with more of my um like my sometimes my older clientele maybe i would get a referral to someone who wanted to sell and they're like we keep seeing your name in the newspaper and so that gives you credibility so my struggle was credibility right sure. i was maybe they knew my parents um you know maybe they knew that i grew up here but they certainly didn't trust me to sell their luxury home and so right. i had to kind of chip away at that credibility and my goal is when someone thinks of luxury real estate, they think of me. Um, so anytime I could put my name next to luxury real estate in people's minds, then that's a win. Brilliant. Right? What a, because, and, and really yeah, all what what you what you could really do if for those of us thinking well what kind of stories i mean you literally just can look at data and the mls mm -hmm. find it really interesting mm -hmm. statistic that is like a little yep. shocking even to you yeah. send that over go guys i have an idea for you um yeah and don't don't uh, give them too much i mean like i yeah. said these guys are overworked don't put more than five sentences in your email right give them a give them a clip give them a taste and see if they're interested they'll call you love it yeah <laughs> so yeah i did that um i uh, started, you know, I, I also realized pretty early on that I, I was very interested in new construction and development. Um, and I learned that when a town or a county wants to hire a contractor, they have to go through a very transparent process because the last thing a municipality wants to be accused of is, you know, like taking kickbacks and hiring their friend for, for a job. And so when a, a town wants to hire a real estate agent to sell a town built project, they have to go through an RFP request for proposal process. Sure. And I learned about this pretty early on in my career, like in a year in, a year and a half in maybe, and um, had a friend who just got her, got her license. And we were like, should we put a proposal in for this project? <laughs> we're a total long shot, but it was for a locals project, still pretty big, it's $25 million project. Um, and we ended up winning the bid uh, because people felt we just went in and created a very professional looking proposal. We took it very seriously and they felt that we would be a good face for the project. We got it. So um, that is also something that's interesting for people to know is that um, oftentimes you're like towns and counties have are doing some of their own real estate development because in so many areas there's a lack of employee or, or locals housing and they're trying to address that themselves. Um, anyone can apply for those for those sales jobs. So that's how I really got started in the development world. And that I learned a ton doing that project and it was a really great experience. And then I faced kind of another challenge after that, which was, okay, now people kind of know me as the like employee housing person. How do I pivot and become 
um, you know, a luxury salesperson, which is more of the area that I was interested in at the time. Um, and so I just kept, kept doing what I was talking about earlier, which is, Hey, put my name next to luxury real estate. We're sending a newsletter. We have luxury listings in there, right? We, we make comments. We're talking about the luxury market because that's where you want to be. You kind of like manifest your, your goals that way. Yeah. That it, it makes sense is, is you, you, you really, I, I think what we're really talking about is branding. It sounds like, yeah. um, you, you very very early on, you know, sort of developed your brand, you were clear about what you wanted your brand to represent. And yes, you're not going to turn down a $25 million development deal from a local municipality, simply because yeah. it doesn't necessarily fit the 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 brand, uh, you know, ideal, but yeah. it's a great opportunity, a great learning experience, and how awesome to be chosen. So you're going to do that. And then you're going to you're going to still return to your North Star, which is luxury. Yeah. And, yeah, and your totally. North stars is, is and, and I want to mention too, that a a lot of times agents, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this, and you you see this as well with other agents, I'm sure, in, in your market, is a lot of times the way agents think about branding is it's all about the visual. So they're doing a lot on social, uh, Instagram, Facebook, there's a lot of, you know, but you don't really that's not really your path. Um, no. and that's a very that's a very unique way. So Talk about is is social a, a part of your marketing strategy, or it, t I'm just curious what the importance <laughs> of it is. Yeah, I think it's more important than we give it credit for. We we could certainly improve on it. Um, we're always talking about it, and everyone I, I've since built a team which we can talk about. But everyone on my team is like, we need to do better at this. So uh, certainly, like anyone, we're not perfect, and and social media is one of those things that we can really improve on. But we, you know, you don't have to be good at everything. You have to do everything great to be great. You just have to be great at a few things. And so I think we're kind of leaning into the things that we're really good at. And, and it kind of makes up for some of our um, things that we're not so great at, which is like social media promotion. <laughs> but no, no and, I don't and, and, and I'm not saying that to identify yeah. something that's that's you're not strong. And I, I was and, yeah. and I hope hopefully you didn't no, no, get that impression didn't come across like that. No. Good, because I really was saying it as as a huge uh, differentiator mm -hmm. that 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 obviously you could always, you know, get good at social if you want to. But that's yeah. <laughs> not how you built your luxury brand. Um, no, you really we, sort of avoided that, which which, again, yeah. you could have traded in a lot of your previous success uh, as a skier, as as a, you, you could have really leaned into some of these accolades that you've you've received and. And, and made that a big push on social, but you didn't do that. And I, I think that's particularly interesting. Again, it, it, it sort of creates a more of a red ocean opportunity for you to find yeah. other, uh, find other Blue ways ocean, to do Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Red ocean. I'm um, sorry. Yeah. We have, so, um, yeah, I think branding can be very simple. Honestly, for me, like I said, my, 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 my mountain to climb was the credibility mountain, right? Because I was young, I was a girl. Um, a lot of people knew me as someone's kid. So I had to, I had to convince people that I was legit. Something I actually haven't really told anyone, which is that, um, when I first started, I didn't, every cent I had was like going towards some investment because we were so into investing. And so I didn't really ever save up to like buy a nice car. <laughs> and so I drove this kind of beat up little Subaru and I certainly couldn't, you know, with a straight face, bring a luxury client into it and tour them on these luxury homes. So I, my parents live in Breckenridge and and anytime I would have a client or a walk and I'd tell my mom who drove a Lexus and I was like, can I use your Lexus? And she was <laughs> the best mom ever. She's like, yes, you can. And so um, just coming right down to just like how, how you present your, not, I'm not trying to say that anyone who wants to become a luxury realtor needs to drive a Lexus or a luxury car, but, but um, presenting yourself in the most uh, professional way that you can, anytime you can, the way that you dress, the way that you speak, the, you know, how you arrive, all of that makes an impact. And all of that does attribute to your branding. It's not just who you are online, because even though social media has exploded so much, I'm, I'm still in the generation where I was here before, you know, the internet and, and your brand really is who you are when you're standing in front of your client. Yeah. Um, and so how can you be the person that you want to be in, you know, if you want to be a luxury real estate agent, what does that look like? And if you have to fake it until you make it, that's fine. Do you have to drive your mom's Lexus around <laughs> or your friend, you know, you pay your friend 50 bucks every time she lends you her BMW because you drive a beat up Subaru, do it, you know, find ways that you can um, present yourself as the brand you want to be. And, and that helped me as well with, 
even it also helps with confidence, you know, dress to impress, you feel, you feel more confident. So yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that's, I think that's, that's really, really great advice. Um, and so talk, let's talk about grind culture because okay. before, before we get into this, I, I want to hear, uh, you're, you're more, you are firmly in the anti-grind culture camp and I, I, I love that because okay. so often we hear about outworking our competition, uh, working more hours, especially in real estate where so much happens outside of the traditional business hours. Yeah. You know, our, our listeners are getting text messages, voicemails, um, you know, all sorts of things late into the evening. Boundaries are hard to set. They're hard to follow. Yeah. It's also yeah. an unstructured job from the realtor side. So it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's tough and it's easy to just keep going and going and going because the text thread really never ends until they right. get the keys. Um, and or then until you forget to respond <laughs> until you forget to respond. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, um, yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about okay. grind culture and, and what, what you, why you've taken sort of a stance against it. Okay. So I live in Breckenridge. I, I don't know if the listeners are familiar, but it's a gorgeous mountain town in Colorado known for skiing, biking, outdoor activities. Um, and when I first started in real estate, um, I, I was a one, one woman show as most people are, and I really wanted to be successful and I'm a competitive person. Right. So I threw everything at it just like I did with, with ski racing. And, um, I remember we, we went on this vacation, my now husband and I, and I just worked the entire time. And we were at the beach and I was on my computer when I was going back to the room and I was taking calls and I was, and I was just, I was just running and I was on vacation and I came back and I was like, that was not a vacation. That was, that wasn't relaxing at all. You know? And then I, I also really realized I just did a little bit of reflection and said like, what do I really want my life to look like? Because I only get one life and um, there's no point in living a life that I'm not excited about because like there's no take backs. Right. And so I live here in this gorgeous place because I love to go skiing. I love to go mountain biking. I love to go for hikes. I love to be outside and I can't do all of that if I'm on all the time. And so I decided that this job, you know, there's multiple things can be true at the same time. Yes. Number one, I want to provide a really high level of service to my clients. Right. Um, number two, I, not perfect. I, one of my very first deals, I like completely dropped the ball on this thing. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what am I doing? I suck at this. And it helped me realize that I am not the person who's going to do everything at all times. Otherwise my life is not going to be what I want it to be. And, and, so, and we should, we should mention that some people can somehow eke that out. Some people can yeah. seemingly do. Some people are designed for that. Some people are designed <laughs> for it. Um, yeah, I think the I'm majority not. of us probably, I'm not either. No. And so, and I, you know, when I'm out on a mountain bike ride and I get a call from a client, I want to be able to help them, but I also don't want to take the call because I'm on a mountain bike ride and that's my time to, you know, clear my head. And, and so what I settled on was I need help and I will plug another book that changed my life called the e-myth it's oh, a, sure. yeah the entrepreneurship myth i recommend if you haven't read it every realtor should read it it's about the importance of building a business like a real business and recognizing what roles you play because if you are a one-man show you are the ceo you are the you know coo you're all the whole executive suite you're also the receptionist and you're, you're, you're the marketing customer specialist. service, you're, you're the social media yeah. person, sales team, yeah. right? So write it down. Say like, Hey, I'm all these people. Am I good at all this? Am I a good receptionist or am I bad at answering the phone? If I'm bad at answering the phone or if I don't like it, then hire someone to help you with it. And so going back to that project that we did with the town of Breck, that, that project, having that almost like guaranteed future income of that development gave me the confidence to bring on my first assistant. And that was a game changer because I realized that I can provide the level of service that I want to my clients while also enjoying my life. And it, not only that, I could provide a better level of service to my clients than if I was just grinding it up alone. Because I started, I think a lot of realtors become a victim of their own success. They're like, okay, if only I can reach this sales number, if only I could have a few more contracts or a few more clients. And then they get there and they're like, whoa, I've got 10 things under contract. Holy moly. And they're like going crazy. And then they're like, 
I, I don't have time to put together a monthly newsletter this month. Like I, I have 10 contracts, right? <laughs> I don't have time to prospect. I don't have time to send these whatever mailers, whatever your strategy is. Um, and so they start dropping the ball on the things that are not urgent because you have to, you're, you're not going to drop the ball on your contract, right? Hopefully. Um, and so having that assistant, having a team built around you helps so that when you do get busy, your monthly newsletter still goes out on the first of the month, right? And you can have a more consistent, reliable level of service to your clients because you have built a system and you've understood that, Hey, I cannot do it all by myself. And I'm actually, I'm doing a disservice to my client trying to do everything myself because I also get sick and I also get burnt out and I also need to go on vacation. Well, and, and that, that probably is a lesson. A lot of, a lot of that you probably learned as a, a teenager being a competitive, you know, super G skier, because you, 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 you can uh, pardon the pun, get to the top of the mountain and, and be yeah. on that Olympic team, or even when, when, you know, whatever uh, event of the Olympics you, you were going for. And yeah. then you can, I mean, all of those are possible. They certainly were possible in, in, in your life. And yet um, how happy, you know, the happiness that you're, that, that you're sort of wanting or the fulfillment you're wanting may come at a significant cost because yeah. uh, the level of, of sort of output that that requires to get to the top of the mountain as a singular person is, yeah. is, well, you know, it's incredible amount of demand on your body, on your mind, on your yeah. time. Um, and, and so I have a question about texting, yep. a very specific question. Okay. So you were talking about, you know, you get the phone call, you're mountain biking. Now you're like, okay, assistant's going to grab that. I, I mm-hmm. get it. You'll, you'll have that routed to the assistant. What mm-hmm. about text messages? Yeah. Text messages are tough. Um, they are really tough. I would say that if it's something that I either don't have the mental space for, or I have something else going on right now. I will just screen grab that and send it to my, uh, send it to my assistant and say, can you help me with this? Or, you know, I'll say, Hey, my, this, this person reached out to me about this. Can you help me? Because, and I like to recognize it. I've learned at the beginning of the correspondence, because if, if you're really busy and you start communicating with your client and then you try and loop someone in, then they're like, no, I'm talking to you about this. But yeah. if they start asking you about something right away and you can say, um, you know, you lose someone in immediately, then that person is the point person. So I, I don't have a perfect answer. Texting is really tricky. And I, I would be lying if I said that, you know, I haven't forgotten about a text and woken up in the middle of the night, like, Oh, never responded to that text. Right. Um, but I do love that the new iPhone, I think you can like mark them as unread. I yeah. don't have the newest iPhone. So I'm excited to get that so that I can like, if I open up a text and I'm not prepared to deal with it, I can mark it as unread and treat it more like a uh, email. But, but that, I think that's helpful because it also to, um, you know, when you start communicating, you're setting, um, via text, you're also setting in motion, like a response time that now gets, yeah. a, a, there's an expectation there. Right. And do you, do you set sort of clear boundaries around, um, you know, I do, in my, and- I do in my own way. Um, not, I don't do it up front. I'm not like, Hey, these are my business hours. Um, some people do that. I, I really respect that. Um, but I do it sometimes you meet, you have a client or you meet someone who you kind of can tell is like a pusher, you know, they're going to kind of push you and push you to kind of see what your limit is. And when I have a client or someone like that, I, I make an effort to not respond. Like, let's say someone who's, who's that personality type texts me. I had a client, I'll just give you an example. I had a client who I showed them a property um, followed up with them. They kind of ghosted me for like a week. And then a week later at like 10 PM, they texted me and they were like, Hey, we're ready for an offer. If we could, um, you know, my husband has, um, work in the morning, but if you could have it ready, you know, before he leaves for work, then we can review Ah, the sign in the morning. Of course. And I was like, you know what? I'm not responding to this because that is in my way, how I'm going to set my boundaries. And if I don't respond to this, it's not going to set a precedent that for the whole contract period, I'm available to do work for you during the night hours. Right. Cause, so not, cause you're I'm in not. a position <laughs> when that text comes in, you're in a position to either defend why you can't do it, yeah. which, which is a lose situation or, yeah. um, or you're going to grind it out and try to get it done at the cost of sleep and energy and, and other things. And, and you're now yeah. also reinforcing their behavior. Yeah. So now they're going, yeah. they're going to, it's not like they're magically going to snap to, mm-hmm. oh, going forward, we're going to, you know, not yeah. pa- text you past five o'clock. No, you've just told them it's perfectly okay what you just did. So yes, that's, you're exactly right. I, I don't want to reinforce that behavior. And, and there's with some clients in certain instances, you know, I have a client who's a, 
a surgeon and his hours are super tough and he wanted to have a call with me at like 8 30 and it's like okay i get it yeah, and i can tell he's not that personality who's going to start calling me every night at 8 30. Yeah, so yeah. i feel like i can read people and i don't set exact hours i respect the people who do um but i think that it's important before you you know if you don't feel like you want to respond to someone because of the time of day or because of you know mostly it's a time of day thing right if you're on vacation hopefully you have coverage from someone but if it's an, in the middle of the night thing don't do it <laughs> if it's that person who's going to just keep because you work, sometimes you work with these clients for like years if they don't find anything or they can't sell their house and so then all of a sudden it's a lot harder to reel back you know once you've opened those floodgates of yeah let me get that done for you at 11 p.m i um i I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I I just think it's such a it's it's a conversation I, I like to have because text communi text communication really is mm -hmm. very complicated in sort of what it what it represents um, in, yeah. in different different side parts of the business. And so it's something that every agent really needs to think through. What's my policy around X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. And yes, when I have the you know the guy who's the surgeon who who's who just got out of a sixteen hour surgery and and he needs to talk to me at eight o'clock at night, I get it. He's not trying to push my buttons or or push yeah. me. He's just that's when he's yeah. available. Of course, yeah. we get that. But but we also understand that you know there there's certain ways we can set, you know, temporary boundaries around, yeah. around sort of our general behavior. I, I also really, and, and I don't talk about this enough, but I think we have a lot of women uh, who come on our show and I, I oftentimes forget as a guy, I don't think as much about this and I should, but I want to talk about sort of gut feelings. And, and I know oh, you yeah. met, tell me a little bit about the importance of trusting your gut. Um, it, it, I mean, I imagine as an athlete, you, you have to know you know, you're, you have to listen to signals yeah. to be a competitive athlete, but, um, you know, I'm curious about sort of gut instinct and, and how that's, you know, manifested in your, uh, at, yeah. in your real estate practice. Yeah. Um, I'm not a very, um, I, I would say I'm a more logical person than anything else. Um, I don't know if they call it left brained. I'm, I'm more logical. Um, and so I, it's easy for me. And I think people like me to dismiss, certain feelings that they have because they're just that feelings. are contradictory they're, maybe to yeah. the logic. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Hey, this client is prepared to spend $10 million. And then your, your feeling is like, walk away. Right. But your head is like, <laughs> well, let me count that commission before I've earned it. Right? Um, right. And so sometimes when you have those conflicting feelings, it can be tough, especially if you're more of a logical person, because you can dismiss these feelings as just that, right. People have feelings all the time. Cause the facts, the facts aren't in yet, but, yeah. <laughs> but the facts say everything looks okay, but yeah, something yeah. inside of me that's more intangible and, and, and invisible is, it's is giving no. me pause. And my logical yeah. brain is going, shut up other part of you. You don't, you don't have any facts. This is yeah. just, you know, whatever you're getting scared or, or whatever yeah. it might be. And, and so the, and, and by the way, this is, this happens all the time. So I, yeah. I'm so glad we're talking about, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's, that's good. So I think there's a lot of us not to get into you know, biology, but there's a lot of the human body that I think we don't totally understand most of us at least. Um, and we are hardwired with certain instincts, right. For eating and resting Protection. and yeah, for all sorts of things that have helped protect us over however many, um, however long in history we've been a species, right? And so I think once I recognize that, hey, sometimes I, that gut feeling is a culmination of various instincts that my body has, those are legitimate, actually. Those are just as legitimate as, as you know, my logical part of my brain, potentially even more, more so because they're, um, older <laughs> they're older they're, they're instincts, older and right? they're bypassing consciousness which consciousness yeah. consciousness can can steer us wrong right as consciousness yeah. can tell us uh, you know things are not the way they appear because yeah. we are imperfect our brains are imperfect um instincts however tend tend to once you're able to identify what an instinct is and and what and the difference between instinct and you know maybe things, you know, fears and, and things that maybe get in the way. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to, to, no, to yeah, take you're over, right. But... You're right. They're there. They're there to protect you. Your instincts are there to protect you for the most part. So listen to them. Um, you know, being, being a woman in the business, I think maybe comes at a little bit higher risk. Um, I don't generally really ever feel unsafe in the business, but I have had instances where, um, it's become clear to me after working with a client that they're, they're really trying to just spend time with me. Um, and not, they're not a real client. Um, 
And there was one instance in particular where that happened. I was working with someone for the whole selling season and we ended up putting in an offer on something and, and uh, you know, I referred him to some local lenders that he could call. And one of the lenders called me and he's like, this guy has no, has nothing. Right. And the whole time he's of course hyping himself up. Like, um, you know, I just sold this business. I have all this money, I have all these houses. And, and so there's a lot that I learned from that because, you know, the lender's like, doesn't have money for down payment, doesn't have a job, can't get a loan, no assets, and no one's going to loan him anything. And I realized over the years, I've realized that people with real wealth, first of all, don't flaunt it like that. The people who do, that's an immediate red flag to me. You know, people who will come in the office and they start talking about how rich and successful they are. There's very few of those people who actually have the means to become a real client of yours. Um, and, and maybe that's just our market. I know different parts, different areas are different, right? Have different people, but in our laid back mountain market, the people who can afford a $5 million house aren't, aren't talking to you about their net worth, you know, in the first conversation you have with them and how they, how successful they are. Um, so anyways, it turns out this guy that I was working with had like a criminal history and, um, I should have done a background check on him and um certainly had no means to to buy a house and i had that gut feeling right at the beginning and i i didn't listen to it and so i said look i'm just gonna i, I spent a lot of time with this guy um who i think was yeah it's, it's to hard to up. exit something like that because <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it because it could it could affect your reputation meaning yeah. it could go online and scorched earth this yeah. realtor dropped me as a client yeah. i was a serious buyer blah 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 yeah. they they you know got, men do weird things when women, yes. when they feel rejected. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I was, you know, I ultimately did have to, to drop him because he came back and wanted to work with me again. And I said, Hey, you know, we need to get pre-qualified this time. And he's like, well, you don't trust me. You don't believe how much money I have. I'm like, I'm hard. When people say so, you don't <laughs> trust me as a question, you can just not trust them. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of things I learned from that. Number one, we have a really good resource with our MLS um, where you can do like free background checks on people. Oh, I that's great. That. Yeah. And I think a lot of MLSs have that or working on yeah. that. So especially if you're going to be, you know, we have a lot of remote areas with like no cell service and we're out showing property. Um, you know, me and some guy that I met 20 minutes ago. Uh, so that's something that's key. I think we're just look them up. I could have found this out by doing a Google search on this guy and I just didn't do it. And then, you know, find ways to, yes, you can ask all of your clients for a pre-qualification letter or proof of funds prior to looking at homes. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But there's also just another layer of, you know, I had a bad gut feeling when I met this guy and I just didn't listen to it. And, and there have been instances since then where I've had a similar feeling and I have listened to it and I've never regretted it. Even no matter how much, because usually with these clients, they're waving, you know, money in your face, which is a gross red flag. But, um, you know, it, it's become a lot easier for me as I've become more successful to realize I don't need this, you know, and, and it's not just about that sort of instance. There's also a lot of people who aren't respectful, right. Or they don't respect you as a professional or the industry. Um, you know, I was just in a listing appointment where the guy's like, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I think real estate professionals are overpaid. And I think it's a, the whole thing is a racket and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I just, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm not going to debate you on that. I'm not going to change your mind. About right. What are the, feel. what are the odds that you're going to change that person's yeah, opinion? Yeah. And, and also I'm not going to, I'm not going to grovel for your business. If you think that I, um, you know, my place in the industry is unwarranted because I don't actually need, I don't need this. I, I can find success working with people who are like me, who, um, see the bigger picture and who are respectful, you know, and, and that's also just been a lifestyle decision for me. It's like, Hey, not only do I want to respect my own boundaries of when I, when I want to be working and when I don't want to be working, but I also want to set my own boundaries of like, who do I want to work with? Cause this is my life, you know, and, and work is a big part of my life. And so I would rather sell 80% of, of what I could sell and just work with good you know, honest people. And I'm not saying, you know, any, anyone in the luxury field knows that not every client, not every luxury client is easy. I'm not trying to say, Hey, this guy's going to be hard. Let's ditch it because we work with our fair share of, of difficult clients and I can be difficult myself. So we all have our own things. Right. But when you get the feeling that someone is, um, you know, not trustworthy or trying to, trying to lie about who knows what, or, um, just like not a good person, you get that feeling. I think you should listen to it because why spend your time working with bad people? Question, question. Has your gut 
ever since you've become a realtor, has your gut ever steered you wrong? No, honestly, it hasn't. And it's been so hard for me because that's not my personality to. You, yes, you, you're more you're, you're logical, <laughs> yeah. fact oriented, look at the data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and it's so hard because I can't explain, you know, I can't explain like, why? Right, you can't walk it back and say, "Oh, the yeah. reason I had that feeling was because uh, right. X, Y, and Z." It's like, no, the feeling showed up before I was aware of anything. Yeah, and I and I'm still not perfect. Like, I just, um, I still have instances where I have this this gut feeling of like, this isn't going to end well. You know, maybe I should decline this, and then I kind of like work work past it and work through it, and then sure enough, my gut was right, and I'm like, okay. So it's not like I have you know just the perfect you know, instinct that I'm always listening to. Sometimes I'm like, sure. that up. I should have listened to, I should have listened to how I felt. But um, I think that's an important thing that, that we don't really talk about enough. It, it just in general is that it's listen, listen to how you feel because also if, if, if for nothing less than when, when someone calls you, if you immediately get a pit in your stomach, I mean, you're going to get a pit in your stomach every single time you need to talk to this person yeah. <laughs> and you need to, you need to figure out, whether or not you want to live with a pit in your stomach because that's not a way to live right so try and, try and find a way <laughs> try and find a way to to be at peace with the, the people that you work with and um it's okay to say no sometimes you know so as you've stepped away from sort of grinding it out which i imagine you know yeah. as the the athlete part of you understands grinding it out and that's yeah. how you achieve and it, it really is you know in many ways such a significant part of an athlete's life yeah. sort of dropping that and trusting that that you can still progress and achieve and and scale the mountain without yeah. necessarily burning you know the the candle at both ends what does your life look like now is it more balanced um you know yeah. and and how are you able to still uh, achieve more, which, uh, you know, you're still in the early, early phase of your real estate career where you're doing more and more and more. And obviously, you know, this year is kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a different year yeah. for, for most realtors, but you're still moving forward and achieving. Um, how yeah. do you do that while maintaining balance? What, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, well, so, so I will kind of like, there's this, I'll mention this adage that I have heard that I really appreciate. I think it's an old African adage. Hopefully I'm not misquoting it, but um, it says, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go as a team. And I, I think that they meant it very literally. Like if you need to get somewhere fast, you better start running by yourself. And if you need to cross a great distance, you better go with a group of people. Um, and I, I, I really like that saying because I, I am kind of a lone wolf in my, by nature. Um, like I only did, I didn't do team sports. I did individual sports. Right. And I was extremely competitive as an individual and, um, I burnt myself out and was plagued with injury. And the thing that meant most to me at that time, which was ski racing. And, and I did, I did get to a pretty high level, but I, I didn't, my career didn't last very long. You know, I retired when I was like, before I turned 20, I think. Um, and so I realized that you know, I should take something away from that, which is life, hopefully, for for most of us is quite long. And if you want to have success in in something, and you want to have elongated success, then it's important that you work with a team, whatever that looks like for you. I'm not saying every single person needs to start a real estate team. But it's important that you recognize that going at it alone, it's it's tough to, you know, it's tough to do stuff alone. So if that just means you have a support group or a group of agents that you meet with to like, you know, talks about your, your highs and lows together, whatever that may be. So, um, that, that wasn't really the answer to your question. So to answer your question, what my life kind of looks like now is uh, it's certainly, and my business, it's not perfect. There's always things where I'm like, Oh, I need to improve on this or we should be doing this. And, um, and so it's, I think it's always going to be like that though. So I've just kind of, I've become comfortable with, that feeling of this is not perfect. And I don't love that I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. So, but that's okay. Right. I'm, 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 I have to tell myself it's okay that my business is not perfect because it's improving. And, well, and, and, and you, you said something at the beginning that, um, 
probably skated by a, a lot of us, but you said two things can be true, right? And and that's yeah. that's I think that's called like dialectical thinking. This idea of yeah, uh, two things that could be in opposition can also yeah. be true, right? We yeah. we all know if we have a, par a romantic partner, we can love that person with all our heart and really be annoyed at something they did at the exact same yeah. time. Yeah, and and letting one of those emotions totally take over is probably mm -hmm. not not the healthiest thing is understanding yes there's times i'm annoyed with you and there's times i love you more than anything and <laughs> both of those can be true at the exact mm -hmm. moment um yes. and so a life can be out of balance and by the way i don't think balance i'm not even sure balance is possible but the striving to yeah. sort of balance is is very you know important and this idea that you can be uh because you are good at things and also not good at things simultaneously right like you were yeah, saying yeah right so so yeah I, I would agree i think finding um i think i've heard of it maybe it's called like a false dichotomy where it's like well it has to be this or that right i have to either yeah. enjoy my life or have a successful career and i can't be I, happy until uh, yeah X. right yeah. right right i can either um enjoy my life or i can save up money right and it's like well you can do both right so I think, I think it's extremely important for people in our profession. They take their real estate class. If you're new in the industry or if you've been doing it forever, um, there's no, like you said earlier, it's not really defined. You know, no one gives you like a manual and says, here's your job description. They're like, here you go. Good luck. You know, sell stuff because <laughs> that's how you get paid. So, um, it's really important to have the headspace to be able to be a little bit introspective and figure out what you want your life to look like because it's one of the best careers in the world to be able to design your own life around it. You could say, hey, look, I'm, I, I don't really feel that competitive. I only really wanna sell enough to pay my rent and go surfing every day. And you can do that, right? Or you can say like, hey, I wanna become the top agent in this market. You know, let's start coming up with some ways that you can do that and also, go on four vacations a year or however, whatever you want to do, because the most successful people aren't going out of the loan. You know, the most successful businesses aren't one person and every single one of us runs a business. So I think we're just, I think that the grind, you know, grind till you die lifestyle, it doesn't take that into consideration that you're, cu you're cutting yourself short and you're doing a disservice to your clients because you really can't <laughs> like we are human we have to sleep right and we have to take a rest and if we really want to develop a good business we need to sometimes take days off so that we can have a creative thought so that we're not just like when's the earnest money deadline when okay did i review that title commitment and oh, god, i gotta gotta get to this appointment because if you're if your mind is constantly on to-do lists you, you can't operate in a creative space that way. You can't come up with new ways to, to do things better than other people. So, you know, give yourself some space, head space, by taking a few things off your plate so you're not just like running around like a chicken with her head cut off. And you can actually have an original thought. Like, hmm, this is something no one else in my market is doing. What if we did that? Right. And I think that's yeah, only possible if you if you can get some help and make and make space. Right. Yeah. And get, and getting yeah. help oftentimes makes that space, as, as you were yeah. saying. And and, you know, too, for those of us listening who are solo practitioners who are thinking, well, I can't afford to hire, um, you know, a, a, an assistant. Well, there is, you know, there are websites where you can post jobs that all over the world people will bid yeah. for your business and they don't have to live in your immediate market for for certain tasks. And True. there's you know, there's lots of things that these are can be highly skilled people that live in 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 areas where the compensation is much different than it is here yep. and oftentimes much lower and you're offering them an opportunity to make a, a good living for them and also yeah. get the help that you need where maybe you can't afford to to get a full-time you know local assistant uh totally. right away and yeah there's um, a lot of there's a lot of creative solutions like that i mean you can if you live near a college people need to intern and they don't they don't necessarily even need to be paid right and yeah. or if you have a group of agents in your office and you guys don't even work together but you're like hey i can't afford someone's salary but i could afford one fifth of someone's salary what about you right so there's a lot of different ways you can accomplish this um but i i do think that if you're going to take your business seriously you know and and you 
pick up the e-myth and you read it and you realize that you're both the CEO and the receptionist of your business and everything in between, um, that there's a better way. Yeah. And it's better for your, for your life too. <laughs> And I, I just want to circle back and this last thing I'll mention, because I think it's really important. And you said this and it's, it's quite profound, um, this idea of making space for mm -hmm. ideas to emerge. So you were yeah. talking about, it reminded me of, of uh, the saying, which is technically, a, a, it's not even a saying, it's, a, it's just true, is that music that that we enjoy it's not actually the notes that that are, are that we're sort of interpreting we're actually interpreting the silence between the notes because yeah. otherwise it's just one continuous sound right yeah. so we all okay yeah we get that but the point of it is is that in order for us to appreciate things we really do have to give it our attention which means making space which means putting down maybe the phone or the tv or and yeah and, and and blocking out some actual time to sit alone and think for a few minutes here and there um, yeah. about let's let's brainstorm some ideas of making you know x better or or changing yeah. y um and and but if you don't spend totally. that time it's unlikely to emerge because we do live in this culture of cons i mean we have a device in our pocket that is unlimited it's unlimited yeah. in its ability to entertain us it's completely yeah. unlimited it's the most powerful thing that we could have ever imagined now sits in our pocket and yeah. can give us any sort of feeling we want at any given time, we just can dial it up. So it's yeah. it's almost quite, it's actually quite dangerous in a sense. So it's extremely so, difficult. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot, Steve Jobs. Um, <laughs> it's all his fault. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I struggle with it. I, I will mindlessly open apps on my phone and I'm like, what am I doing? You know? And, and I will say that if it sounds overwhelming to set everything aside and have a brainstorming session, some people are like, what does that even mean? you don't have to go forward with always having a purpose to something. And, and that is something that I've learned as I've gotten older, because, you know, when, when I was younger and when I was a ski racer, I couldn't just like go for a stroll, right? I'd have to do like intervals, right? Sprinting for 30 seconds and then recovering and sprinting and recovering. And all my friends were like, you are crazy. Can you just come on a walk with us? I'm like, no, actually I can't, I have to train. And so now it's okay to just be right. If you can figure out a way to just be, so if you, if you don't want to turn your phone off and do a brainstorming session for your job or, you know, for your business, turn your phone off and just go for a walk yeah. or take a shower or, you know, if you like to paint, paint, just make space for you not to be so um, uh, turned on all the time because all of a sudden you will be on that walk with no intention of coming up with any ideas for your business. And you will be like, Hey, how did I not think of this sooner? Because all of a sudden your mind has the capacity to actually problem solve. Um, and that's just burnout. The grind culture it doesn't allow, it doesn't have that space. So you got to make it. I think that's perfectly said and a great place for us to wrap. What I, what I would like to say for everyone listening is that Breckenridge is a town where people oftentimes have, you know, a condo that they go to visit and ski in, or maybe they have a second home because they enjoy, you know, everything about that part of the country, which it's like such a perfect sort of place. Um, and, and, and so this is an opportunity for anyone listening. If you do have clients that love to ski or love to be outdoors and are looking in areas to maybe retire to, or even have a second home, you know, Leah and her team would love the opportunity to connect with you. Um, Leah, or, and of course, if anyone's listening out there who is looking <laughs> to purchase or or list a property in the Breckenridge and Summit County area. I mean, Lee and her team obviously are a, a great choice. They are not only one of the top teams in the area, they're Leah and her team is literally one of the top agents in all of Coldwell Banker, including not just this country, but the entire world. So if somebody out there is looking to connect with you in, in some way, Leah, what's the best way that they should do that? Oh man, you know, here's the thing about being a realtor. You could just look up my name and you will find all of my personal information. <laughs> so you, it's pretty easy to find my phone number, my website, my email, <laughs> but so um, we, yeah, what we'll is do a, is, yeah, we can send everyone right over to the website, which is mountainhomesgroup.com. Again, mountainhomes, yeah. plural, 
uh, group.com. The link will be in our show notes and you can find all things Leah there. You can connect with her. Uh, should you, you know, want to, you know, set up a referral system. And by the way, Leah also has, I'm sure clients that uh, move from the area as well. So probably a good person to connect with. Um, so, and, and so Leah, we, we are so excited. Congratulations again on the uh, NAR 30 under 30. Um, what, a, what a huge, huge honor, not surprising for what you've accomplished thus far, but Thank also um, I'm glad that I'm glad that National Association of Realtors recognized you because of course, seeming seems very well deserved and we wish you the very best as you're you know again um I, you're sort of going up the mountain as opposed to <laughs> traditionally in the past always going down the mountain uh in, in your in your other career but um no. so part part in the silly pun there but but the um but but i i'm very excited to continue to watch your your ascent um and and as you build your business you know we want to check back in with you and see uh, how it's going and what new lessons you've learned because um you know your business will continue to evolve continually evolve and you'll have better ideas as well as as things uh change so we are excited to keep that uh keep that conversation going for so everyone um who's made it all to the way to the end we appreciate you our listeners our viewers on behalf of leah and i we thank you for st sitting and listening to us talk uh, hopefully this was helpful to you i trust that it was it was for me and i know we'll get a lot of great feedback from our audience and speaking of feedback let us know what you think of the show so best way to do that if you're listening through a podcast app leave us a review let us know um whether it's apple you know podcasts or spotify stitcher Google um, podcasts anywhere. Just let us know what you think of the show. We read every comment. And um, on so on behalf of Leah and I, we say thank you. And of course, on behalf of the audience, we say thank you to Leah for coming on and really giving us her perspective of what's been working for her. And there's been so many great tips in here that I know our audience is going to be thrilled um, to uh, share this episode with another realtor. So best way to do that, just send them over to our website, keepingitrealpod.com. We have every episode we've ever done. You can stream it right online. Um, if the person you're sending over isn't a podcast person, just send them to our website, keepingitrealpod.com. And thank you again to everyone. Leah, thanks again. And we will see everybody on the next episode.